Good day and welcome to the wrist and hand fracture lecture. The objectives for this lecture are the following. To recognize and diagnose upper limb fractures specifically in the wrist and hand, we will look at distal radius fractures, base of the thumb, the scaphoid, metacarpal and phalangeal fractures. Also, you should be able to then discuss the best management, either non-operative or operative for these fractures. And also then discuss if you've decided that the specific fracture needs surgical intervention, what type of surgical management would you think will be best for that individual? Distal radius fractures. They account for 75% of all four arm fractures. And also important to note is that the most frequent mechanism of injury is a fall on the outstretched hand, especially in the older population. When you see a younger person presenting with a distal radius fracture, that is normally due to a high energy injury. So the distal radius is responsible for 80% of the axial load through the arm. If you look at the osteokinematics, there are three columns. There's the radial column, the intermediate and the ulnar column. The radial column is made up out of the radial styloid and the scaphoid fossa where the scaphoid articulates in. The intermediate column is where the lunar sits. That's in the middle. Then on the ulnar side, the ulnar column of the radius is where your TFCC and your distal ulna articulates. TFCC stands for triangular fibrocartilage complex. Each one of these three columns are crucial and has a function. The radial side it's your load bearing and it acts especially for activity, activities done while your wrist is in ulnar deviation. The middle part, the intermediate column, is to transmit load from the corpus to the forearm. And on the ulnar side, that is to stabilize your drudge, distal radius ulnar joint, when your forearm moves. For instance, with pronation, and supination movements. So after a person has fallen or with high energy car accident and sustained a distal radius fracture, always be on the lookout for associated injuries. These injuries are scaphoid lunate ligament in 60% of cases, lunar triquetral ligament tears in 15%. Drudge injuries, a radial styloid fracture, so always be on the lookout for this type of fracture, and even a ulnar styloid fracture on the x ray, other ligament tears, TFCC injuries occur in 46% of distal radius fracture individuals and other cartilage lesions. Considering the classifications for distal radius fractures, Fernandez based these on the mechanism of injury, Fragman based it on joint involvement, Malone in their classification divides the intraarticular fractures into four types and they based it on the displacement of the fracture. You will see the AO has done tremendous work to classify up all fractures in the body almost. So it's very comprehensive. Go and download the AO classification and you will see. It's a bit cumbersome, but definitely one of the most comprehensive classifications for fractures in the body. So, when looking at an x-ray and you see a fracture line 
The doctors, the surgeons used the following to make the decision whether to do a operative intervention or a non-operative intervention. So they use the following principles. Measurements, they measure the volar tilt, the radial height, the radial inclination, and the articular step off. So for the volar tilt, they look at the lateral x-ray view, and they look at how much does the, the fragment of the radius tilt. Normal is 11 degrees. And if there's the acceptable criteria where they will not operate, where they will decide maybe to do non-operative, is a dorsal angulation of less than 5 degrees or within 20 degrees of the contralateral side. So if you think about dorsal and volar, remember dorsal is towards the posterior side of your hand. Volar or palmar is towards the anterior side of your hand. So the radial height, they will look at if there's any shortening produced by the fracture or because of the fracture. So normal is 13 millimeters and if there's a shortening of less than five then that will be acceptable but if it's more than five they will do operative intervention. Radial inclination is also one of the measurements and then an articular step off. So they will use the anterior posterior view for, of the, of the x-ray and there should be no articular step off. Less than two millimeters is acceptable, but more than two millimeters, they will have to restore that fracture back to the most perfect anatomical position to avoid post-traumatic osteoarthritis. So as a continuation of a discussion of the radi radius um, fracture, the distal end, I'm going to start talking also about the different types of fractures we get. We know that it's very common in the older population, especially osteoporotic women, to sustain a distal radius fracture. Distal, meaning 2.5 to 3 centimeters of the radius is fractured. But specifically in the Collis fracture, you will see that the displacement is posteriorly, dorsally, like in the picture. So it looks like a dinner fork presentation. There's often an associated avulsion fracture of the iloid the ulnar styloid process or a tear of the UCL ligament but you have to look at the x-ray to see if that little ulnar styloid process is fractured or not. So it's not a given. The fracture can also extend into the radial carpal joint but that is more present with a Barton's fracture that is an intraarticular fracture. So you will see that a Collis fracture is extraarticular, but there may be some, some extension. So x-ray views are important. A CT you will ask for, for operative planning, when they want to make sure, but where are the different fragments? and if there's any intra-articulation involvement. Remember, 
MRI is to evaluate soft tissue. So when you suspect a TFCC tear or ligament injuries like your scaphoelunar ligament or your lunar triquetral ligament injuries, then you will ask for an MRI. Also a clenched fist view x-ray is also good to assess scaphoelunar ligament tears. The typical deformity, as previously mentioned, is a dinner fork deformity due to that dorsal angulation and displacement. Complications after not just the coles but also a distal radius fracture is excessive swelling and stiffness of the hand. So, from the beginning, make sure you tell your patients that they should be should move their fingers and elbow and also incorporate edema measurements like elevation of the of the hand above the heart level also median nerve compression malunion of the fracture if for instance the patient is incorrectly immobilized in a arm sling, then a stiff shoulder can occur. So always remember in your management that unaffected joint should not be immobilized, but may be mobilized early. Be on the lookout for any central pain mechanisms, like for instance reflex sympathetic dystrophy or CRIPS, complex regional pain syndrome where that hand will become red, swollen, sweaty, painful. Allodynia, where when you touch the hand, there is an excessive reaction of the patient that you don't expect with the type of palpation or pressure you applied. Hyperesthesia. So all of that relates to a centralization of the pain. That is why early mobilization is imperative of the unaffected joints. You will see that there is also a drive to after uh, open reduction internal fixation and RF that there's early mobilization but always respecting pain. Be on the lookout for rupture of the extensor pollicis longus tendon as well. The collis fracture definitely occurs more often. But when a person falls on the back of their hand or on a flexed wrist, then a Smith fracture can occur. And that is where the displacement is in the opposite direction as the collis, and that is a volar displacement. In this image, you will see the displacement after or during a Smith fracture, where the distal part, including that fracture, moves in a volarly direction. A Barton type fracture is a fracture that is intraarticular, 
It's a fracture of the anterior portion of the distal radius and it extends into the joint with an anterior subluxation of the corpus. So you will see that this requires operative intervention. In the management of distal radius fractures, there are four options. A close reduction and immobilization as number one. Or close reduction percutaneous spinning with K-wires. Open reduction internal fixation with plates and screws with K-wires if needed. And then ex the option of external fixation. So remember the different measurements that are used by surgeons to determine whether operative management would be required. If there is excessive displacement, shortening or intraarticular fractures, they, they will require surgical management. So close reduction and immobilization can be done with either a splint or a cast immobilization below elbow plaster of Paris. And just take care to avoid extreme flexion and ulnar deviation. So make sure that the position inside the cast is a good position. And that's also determined by the reduction Close reduction percutaneous spinning is where they will drill K-wires dorsally into the fracture, make sure the reduction is good under a C-arm, and then drill the K-wire further into the proximal radius. Be on the lookout for the, radi the radial sensory nerve or pin track infections. So open reduction internal fixation can either be done with a volar plating or dorsal plate. Both of them have got their various challenges. Volar plating take care of your flexor pollicis longest as it can rupture. The dorsal plate again is used with, for displaced intraarticular fractures with dorsal comminution and there the extensor tendons also need to be carefully considered during the operation. Complications is that this, the screw in the radiocarpal joint or the drudge is a problem. So make sure after the surgery that there is no screws penetrating the joint space of the radiocarpal joint or the distal radius ulnar joint. Also be on the lookout for any tendon rupture. And then take care by avoiding forearm rotation with especially intraarticular fractures where there's a drudge involvement as pronation and supination will disrupt the healing. Then also a decision can be made to use an external fixator. Remember that when there's an open fracture, when there's any wound present after the injury, that an operative management will be followed. If there are any nerve fallout and it's an open fracture, the surgeon will look at the nerve. If it's a closed fracture with nerve fall out, let's say for instance a median nerve fall out where the fracture compressed against the median nerve in the carpal tunnel, then they will not simply open up to an open reduction. They will then monitor and that also depends on what the displacement and the shortening of the fracture is like and will also need to be considered in 
the best management. External fixation is normally for very uh, common knitted fractures. Now we move to the scaphoid fracture. Scaphoid is a carpal bone, one of eight carpal bones in the human body. The scaphoid is in the proximal row on the radial side and articulates with the lunate in the, ra in the radial fossa of the radius, the distal radius. It is the carpal bone most commonly injured when falling on an outstretched hand. It's 60 to 70 percent of all carpal fractures are scaphoid fractures, and it is often missed in diagnosis. So, in clinical presentation, when a patient says that it's painful over the snuff box, over the scaphoid, painful on palpation in the anatomical snuff box, when there is reduced range of motion of the wrist, especially extension, and there's a grip strength decrease of more than half, this, half of the unaffected side, then suspect a scaphoid fracture. It, it often doesn't present on an x-ray immediately. So then if your patient presents with these, it is definitely worthwhile putting them in a plaster of Paris. Often happens with sports, like soccer, volleyball, where even cycling, falling on an outstretched hand. The immobilization after sustaining a scaphoid fracture or when it is suspected but not yet confirmed by an x-ray should be a cast looking like the one at the top left, where the thumb is included but the IP of the thumb remains open. Remember also that it is important to assess vascular status by looking at the temperature of the hand, feeling, palpating, what is the temperature compared to the other side, looking at the color of the fingers, also assessing the capillary refill by pushing, pressing on the nail of your patient and the blood should be returning within two to three seconds. That is normal blood circulation. The image on the bottom shows exactly how the blood supply to the scaphoid is, where you will see the most distal part of the scaphoid has got in, marked in green 100% union rate because the blood supply is good. But as you move more proximally down in the direction of the wrist or the elbow or the radius, then you will see that there is not as much blood supply and the union rate also decreases in the proximal pole. Here you can see this, the radial artery giving off a branch to provide circulation to the scaphoid. Non-union is a big problem, especially with proximal pole scaphoid fractures. And it results in extreme pain, decrease in range of motion, as well as grip strength. So early diagnosis and treatment is essential and that assures 90 to 95% of union. Contributing factors to, to not fracture not healing is delayed di diagnosis, the proximal pole vascularity, presence of the dorsal intercalated segment instability, that is where the wrist itself, the carpal bones move in a dorsal direction because of the scaphoid not being 
in place anymore as well as a possible ligament injury. So the integrity of the carpal stability can be affected after a scaphoid injury and need to be assessed. So the fragment displacement of the scaphoid more than one millimeter or angulation of a part of the, the fracture more than 20 degrees between the distal and the proximal fragments will require operative management with either a small screw and that is most often used. Undisplaced fractures can be treated conservatively in the scaphoid cast. Average healing time, it takes, it takes a while, 6 to 12 weeks in the cast. Make sure the cast is not too tight, the, the unaffected joints that are left open are mobilized very early and that edema is managed. RF with compression screws allows for earlier return to sport. So deformity of the scaphoid can alter the range as well as the radial and ulnar deviation of up to 